We're currently doing a workshop on institutional economics actually over at Brody and for the today and tomorrow and Dan was kind enough to come over from Wisconsin and visit with us as part of that. And so we thought we'd do a talk for him on his new book coming out and thought we'd move it over here because I know it'd be much easier for people to come over and even though we're after a semester and I'm glad to see some people are still here, that's good. Um, so Dan's book's coming out in October, and it's called Possessive Individualism, A Crisis of Capitalism. That's what he's going to talk about, and we are recording this for posterity, so just so you know. Um, and so let me introduce Dan. Dan, thanks. Thank you for uh, coming on this nice day. Um, I can't start without mentioning Warren Samuels and Al Schmid. Uh, Two polar opposites. Warren Samuels was a man of too many words. Al was a man of no words at all. I remember once he called me up and said he'd like to come to Madison to discuss a few things. This was back in the 70s. And I said, yeah, that's a good idea. Come on over. So I hung up and then I said to my wife, Al never talks. What are we going to talk about? And I reflect back on the two of them because Warren had all the answers. And Al had all the questions. And between the two of them, it was fantastic, right? You'd go to dinner with them at the economics meetings, and Warren was holding forth, and Al would just kind of sit there and listen. And these are two giants that Michigan State left to the world, and you folks deserve a lot of credit for harboring and nurturing these two very different people, yet two people who are very much concerned with the structure and the workings of the economy, which is what institutionalism is all about. The title of my book is Possessive Individualism, A Crisis of Capitalism. We know that political alienation is a threat to modern democracies. Americans are angry, the British are angry, authoritarian strong men are leading several European countries. And the current American president is an incurious narcissist whose temper and demeanor defy all standards of decency. Meanwhile, millions of desperate migrants are streaming north out of the Middle East, out of Africa, out of Latin America. Many people blame stagnant household incomes and income inequality. However, in my book, I argue that the origins of the current world disorder are, in a sense, a failure of the Enlightenment to anticipate the acquisitive individual as a creature of global capitalism. I am linking the Enlightenment and the creation of the individual with global capitalism. I suggest that the cultural glorification of the acquisitive individual stands in the way of necessary government programs to ease the economic burden on beleaguered households. Meanwhile, our cultural fixation on the individual authorizes owners of firms celebrated as job creators to suppress wages and salaries, to embrace automation, and to move jobs overseas. In short, capitalism is no longer an engine of improved livelihoods, and social hope. That's the point of my book. Escape from the current crisis requires that the isolated acquisitive individual rediscovers a sense of loyalty to others as neighbors, as colleagues, and as participants in the shared social process of living. Escape also requires that the private firm be imagined, reimagined as a public trust in which the economic well-being of employees becomes a central part of its purpose. In the absence of these dual transformations in us and in capitalism, the system that we know cannot endure. How did we get ourselves in this fix? In my remarks, I will present four distinct themes to help you grasp where I'm going and how I approach this in a diagnostic sense. In their historic sequence, I'll talk about the emergence of capitalism in the 19th century as a source of social hope. 
I'll talk about the transition early in the 21st century into what I call managerial capitalism as a source of social despair. I will talk about the modern capitalist society as one of foxes and hedgehogs. If you don't know the metaphor of the fox and the hedgehog, I'll help you get there. And then I'll talk about the necessary need to recover social hope. Capitalism as an economic system must first be demystified, and it is relatively easy. Owners of capital, machines, and liquidity, liquidity hire owners of labor power. It's a wage contract. That's all it is. Very simple. This fraught nexus of two classes of owners defines Western society since about 1400 in England. Former feudal landlords were forced in the wake of the Black Death and the, and the elimination of about 50% of the English population to begin to hire workers they actually needed. By 1600, the agricultural employment was only one half of the English countryside. The rest of it were proto-capitalists operating under what we would call merchant capitalism. Here was the first entrepreneur making simple furniture, agricultural implements, commercial wagons. The first phase of capitalism gradually gave way around 1750 to what we know as industrial capitalism. Industrialization offered well-paying jobs in urban settings and rural to urban migration followed apace. Dramatic population growth emerged along with the rise in real agricultural value. The index of real industrial value almost quadrupled over what had been achieved earlier. While Charles Dickens and Karl Marx would become famous for their accounts of the horrors of the factory system, it must be acknowledged that these first two phases of capitalism, merchant capitalism, industrial capitalism, provided profound economic promise for millions of rural people who were both pushed and pulled out of agriculture into urban areas. Capitalism until the start of World War I in 1914 was an engine of social hope, but it would not last. From the beginning of industrial capitalism, there had been an acute need for very substantial tranches of financial intermediation in the operation of the capitalist firm. The massive scale of modern industry, steel, railroads, automobiles, trucks, would have been impossible without large infusions of borrowed capital. Two world wars, the first in history that relied on large-scale armaments and organized ocean transport, gave industrial capitalism just what it needed. By 1950, financial capitalism ruled our life. This is the third phase. This post-war era lasted 25 to 40 years, gave us affordable homes, automobiles, the spread of the suburbs, an abundance of labor-saving devices for millions of new suburban homes, and plausible incomes. These were the golden years in the U.S. Households with one person in the workforce could acquire a nice home, children could obtain a college degree, and Life magazine could celebrate the American dream. Limited, of course, to those who by accident of birth happened to be white. Everyone else was quarantined out of sight. We never saw them. At the center of that evolution was the modern corporation. The corporation made it possible for companies to attract massive infusions of cash. The corporate form of capitalism brought concentrated economic power that enabled the corporation to contend with, notice the verb, to contend with the political power of the modern state. Perhaps the nation state was going to be forced to contend with the modern corporation. In 1932, Adolf Burl and Gardner Means observed that the law of corporations might well be considered the potential constitutional law of the new economic state, while business practices many aspects of administrative government. The golden years of the last half of the 20th century would not endure. The financial crisis of 2007, started in December 2007, ran to 2009, fueled by excessive leverage and a blossoming of new exotic financial devices and tricks destroyed millions of lives and brought bankruptcy to over seven million households. The entire population of the state of Washington was rendered bankrupt by that event. The economic catastrophe, which continues to inspire fear and loathing, 
was actually the delayed effect of events that had begun in the 1980s. It was then that the large-scale movement of international capital emerged as a dominant feature of emerging economic relations among nation states. We call it globalization. We are now in the fourth phase of capitalism. I call it managerial capitalism. The entrepreneur of merchant capitalism surrendered his or her autonomy to the engineer of industrial capitalism. The engineer was soon pushed aside by the bankers of financial capitalism. Now under managerial capitalism, the wrangler rules. Let's talk about the emergence of foxes and hedgehogs. The Greek word oikos, the root of economics, captures the idea of the household or the family. The discipline of economics grew out of concern for the, how this basic unit of human existence continually organized its provisioning and thereby secured its future. From early days, the subject of economics concerned the well-being of the household as it contributed to the wealth of nations, to borrow a phrase from Adam Smith. The subject matter of economics is therefore properly understood to concern an investigation into how individuals and societies organize themselves for their provisioning. But of course, that's not how we teach the subject to undergraduates. Notice the important sequence here. Humans must first organize themselves, and then they might be able to organize their provisioning. Unfortunately, this historic focus on the well-being of the household has been pushed aside by a perverse focus on individual rationality and the presumed sanctity of the consumer. We must recall that the household is the only natural organization in human society. It is natural because it is the only entity that is predicated upon biological considerations. In contrast to the naturally occurring family, a firm is an artificial construct, a contrivance with no inherent logic. Firms can cease to exist. Families run into the future. Our interest in these two social contracts, one natural, the other contrived, is justified by the necessities of the modern economic system. Households rely on firms for jobs and income, and they acquire desired goods and services from firms. Firms rely on households to provide labor power and to purchase what has been produced. It is a symbiotic relationship fraught with dependence resentment, and very often, open conflict. It is rarely a happy mutuality. The essential concern of our time is the increasing economic irrelevance of the household as a supplier of labor power to the capitalist firm, the profound inconvenience of hired labor, and the enticing promise of automation wherever possible is the defining trait of the problem we are discussing. This brings me to the legend of the fox and the hedgehog. The story is inspired by claims attributed to Homer, popularized by Archilochus. The hedgehog is a focused, driven, motivated, single dominant organizing principle. The fox is a multi-purpose, wily, broad-spectrum opportunist and a necessary pursuer of a number of tasks. The peripatetic fox knows many things. The hedgehog knows one big thing. The instrumental agent of managerial capitalism, what I call the wrangler, is an accomplished hedgehog. Managerial capitalism is animated by a stark and demanding commitment. If the financial fundamentals of the firm are not carefully managed, predatory private equity funds and hedge funds will swoop in to acquire and then resell or rationalize the mismanaged firm. Private equity funds and hedge funds produce nothing. Their sole purpose is to generate earnings for investors in such funds through the buying and selling of existing firms. Hedge funds accumulate large tranches of investment capital from ultra high net worth individual subscriptions and then move those holdings of bundled money around in pursuit of firms' assets that will yield an immediate return. Such funds are not making things or serving customers. They are making money from firms who do that. The best hedge funds pick an early target, overwhelm resistance with their financial heft, and then resell their acquisitions for a quick financial gain. The financial gain then allows them to continue preying down the hierarchy of investment possibilities, magnifying their financial clout as they go. The recent ravages of the, U of the U.S. retail sector, 
notably Sears, has been exacerbated by the financial wizardry of hedge funds. Sophisticated computer algorithms and ready available data allow a highly granular analysis of a large number of investment possibilities. Mining those data are the hedge funds' means of control. By way of contrast, private equity funds exist to create long-term gains through the purchase of underperforming firms and subjecting them to the harsh discipline of what is called the deal funnel. Managers of private equity funds often have specialized knowledge of particular types of firms, so their predatory initiatives are informed by the set of technical sector skills unique to each fund. We might think of this activity as something like boot camp, only not for young recruits, but for the seasoned owners and managers who have become inattentive to the pennies. Bloated firms are slimmed down through scrunching, that's the term of art, scrunching, and their new leaner management structure and cost profile makes them attractive to other investors. Private equity funds rehabilitate underperforming firms so that they are attractive to a new array of buyers. But very often, saddle these reconstituted firms with enormous debt. The better to reward the individuals who are responsible for the scrunching and the layoffs. As Joseph Schumpeter reminded us, capitalism eats its children. Households quake at the feast. It can be no surprise that high cost and perhaps bloated labor force is often the first place where savings can be achieved. Older workers are often paid more than younger workers, so they can be discarded as part of necessary downsizing, being careful not to make it look like the discrimination against old folks. Launching labor-saving technical change is another popular move. The artful language would suggest that the saved labor is being held in some special bank where it can be redeployed. In fact, save labor is just put out on the street, free to find work if it can elsewhere. Since this scrunching of underperforming firms is widespread, workers who have been pushed out usually remain on the sidelines. Alternative employment can be difficult for many victims of the deal funnel. And we wonder why voters are angry. Notice that individual firms under managerial, managerial capitalism do themselves not need to be acquired by these financial poachers. The mere existence of such funds, whose defining purpose is to prey on suboptimal going concerns, sends a strong signal to all firms they had better get it right, or they too will be cannibalized by these predatory surgical specialists. The credible threat is sufficient to send a strong signal throughout the capitalist market economy. Get lean or be eaten. Shareholders applaud every move as labor costs and other alleged inefficiencies are squeezed out of the cumbersome firm. Workers are dispensable. Managerial capitalism has brought new perils to the economic future of many households. Firms now behave like hedgehogs. All attention is focused on one big thing. That big thing is market valuation in the eyes of shareholders or potential buyers. Nothing else matters. The officers of such firms, whose compensation contracts abound with performance incentives tied to market share, to growth, market valuation, understand very well this intense unitary focus and therefore adjust management strategies accordingly. Costs are reduced with ruth ruthless pressure on suppliers. And of course, growth in the sheer size of firms renders them extraordinarily exacting and forceful in their pursuit of cost reduction. Walmart and Amazon are notorious belligerents in this regard. They are too big to resist. Relentless pressure on labor costs becomes even more sustained and thorough. So-called burdensome regulations and taxes become prime targets in this multi-front war on costs. Political allies are crucial in this program of cost reduction. Our political gridlock can be attributed to whether a politician is a champion of hedgehogs or of foxes. Recall that on the demand side of the market, firms can only appeal to customers to purchase what they hope to sell. Constant attention to product quality, to advertising, and to promotional campaigns are standard aspects of this necessary work on the demand side. But all such efforts are mere pleadings. Things are different on the supply side. Owners of firms can work strategically to influence politicians about the need for lower taxes, to lobby against so-called regulatory interference in the internal workings of the firm, 
etc. Firms can keep up focused hostility to any initiative that will raise wage rates or their total payroll. Firms will threaten to relocate where the business climate is more favorable. Politicians cower. No wonder the foxes are angry. I want to talk now about what I call recovering social hope. The appeal of a market economy is that one can enter and leave any particular market with perfect ease. There are no obligations, right? Engaging the market is entirely volitional, unless, of course, one needs to eat. Since eating is essential to survival, living in a market society leaves one with no choices to make. In other words, rather than thoroughgoing freedom in a market economy, Milton Friedman's silly claim, the need to eat gives rise to coercive pressure to participate in the market for labor. And refusal by firms to hire those who need work in order that they might eat gives rise to coercive pressure against the will to live. Who can possibly believe that a capitalist market economy is free of coercion? The two essential going concerns of capitalism are households and firms. The question we must now confront is whether these two components stand on equal moral footing in the political realm. Recall that the family, the evolving household, is self-justifying by its very nature. The same grace cannot be granted to those social entities called firms, whether corporations, joint stock companies, sole proprietorships, cooperatives, you name it. Each specialized form of these entities requires social justification. They must, from time to time, explain and justify their legitimacy to us. In other words, these various artificial going concerns, these legal contrivances, obtain their legitimacy by our periodic and collective grant of usefulness. All such contrivances are example of a public trust. In plain terms, there is no such thing as a private firm, nor is there in the economic realm anything to which the adjective private can be properly applied. A private firm is a contradiction in terms. The mere fact that virtually all such contrivances must be licensed, authorized, sanctioned, inspected, monitored, taxed accordingly, makes clear that these contrivances are artificial. While they are owned by individuals in various legal arrangements, all firms exist and function by the grace of the political entity we call the nation state. This claim may be novel, but it cannot be controversial unless you haven't thought about it. We know well that all such artificial contrivances are imbued with extraordinary political urgency. In some circles, there is nothing quite as revered as the private firm. Firms are job creators. Firms are the engines of prosperity. Firms are the font of redeeming social habits and thrift, efficiency, accountability, what have you. Politicians often consider it unpatriotic to expect firms to pay taxes. Doing so might jeopardize their central role as saviors of the capitalist market economy. Are there good reasons for this stark asymmetry between the shared reverence for firms and a general indifference towards the household? Firms, unlike households, must be noticed and contended with. Firms need to be accommodated in a market society. And since firms hold the key to the ability of households to earn an income and to acquire the necessities of survival, firms are at the very center of the existence and flourishing of households. Consumers need firms and firms need consumers. The ability of households to affect firms is only one way. We can affect firms by negation. That is, we can withhold our custom from firms, and they can withhold their labor power, and we can withhold our labor power from firms. But aside from trying to harm firms by spreading malicious rumors about them, members of households have very little ability to exert or impose harm on firms. In contrast, firms have the capacity to inflict considerable harm on households. Firms can refuse to hire members of households when asked to do so. Firms can fire members of households. Firms can make extraordinary work demands on members of households. And it will be said that, of course, firms should not have to hire workers they don't need or workers who are not qualified. Of course, firms should be able to dismiss incompetent or unworthy workers. Of course, firms should be able to tell workers what they must do and so on. And obviously, firms must be able to monitor the clothing and general appearance 
of their individuals that they employ. Under ideal circumstances, each of these objections is obviously true. By adopting advancing technology, the number of workers that a firm needs will certainly diminish in the fullness of time. However, is this new technology adopted because it is cheaper? Or is it being adopted to liberate firms from their dependence on households and their incessant labor needs? The standard answer is to encourage such workers to, other, to find other lines of work. This churning of the labor force is thought to be good. Of course, replacement jobs might offer slightly lower pay, but the economy will move along fine on its no lower cost path. This will, be thought, this will be thought good, since displaced workers into the labor market might actually reduce existing wages a little bit, and the economy will come even more efficient. And if there is an influx of new workers in the economy, perhaps because immigrants come in, then overall wages may indeed be pushed down slightly and profits will be further enhanced. As long as costs are driven down, prices in a market economy will fall and consumers will benefit. Isn't that how we measure welfare? The above scenarios are precisely concerned with this fraught interplay of households and firms. Notice that the active agent, it is firms adopting labor-saving technology, putting downward pressure on wages, fighting off unions, perhaps even moving abroad. Members of households, those who are currently employed or those who would like to be employed, are passive observers and recipients of profound changes that affect their livelihood prospects. Members of households are not asked if they are in favor of labor-saving technology. They are not asked how they feel about downward pressure on wages. And they certainly are not asked how they feel about their employers shuttering the plant and moving to China, to Mexico, to Thailand, or the Philippines. And of course, the standard response is that it is entirely within the rights of the firms to do these things and whatever else is necessary for them to flourish. And therein lies the fundamental challenge to capitalism. How to reconcile the inevitable tension between the lively and livelihood imperatives of the household and the survival imperatives of the owners of these artificial contrivances we call firms. This is a problematic point because the reigning zeitgeist is to celebrate the revered freedom for firms to behave as they see fit in the interest of low prices for us. In return, members of households who gain what is called welfare by the abundance of goods and services at low prices must adapt as best they can. Reassure those individuals that they will be better off in the long run by the relentless downward pressure on prices and that this will enable them to consume what they wish at ever lower costs. Unless, of course, they do not have an income from the sale of their labor power to firms. Consumers in households gain when prices fall. Workers in those same households lose when wages fall. No wonder foxes are nervous, always looking over their shoulder. Firms and households are moral agents because they are realms of choice and action with profound implications for others beyond the boundary of that decision-making unit. A member of a household who abuses a family pet or a child is making a moral choice. An employee who steals pencils or notepads from her employer is making a moral choice. An employer who rejects a qualified job applicant because of the applicant's race is making a moral choice. A corporation that establishes a tax haven in the Cayman Islands to hide net income is making a moral choice. Both of these core components of capitalism Firms and households have the capacity to make moral choices with implications for others. But there is not profound symmetry, as I have been saying. The scope for actions of firms to visit harm on households far exceeds the scope for households to visit harm on firms. Indeed, the entire history of labor policy has been voted, devoted to efforts to limit the scope of harm to households by actions of the capitalist firm. When workers first sought improved work conditions and higher pay, it was fought by owners of firms on the grounds that it would harm their net income. The political fight, therefore, turned on balancing the interests of net income to this artificial contrivance of the firm as against the income of households whose members were employed by those firms. The discourse about the moral choice was often bizarre, however normal it might have appeared at the time. There was concern that if firms were required to make the workplace safer 
or offer shorter working hours or increase pay, the firm might not be able to survive. What about the survival of households? Firms could not seek relief by appealing to sympathy for their plight. To pursue that avenue would have put them on the same tack as that employed by workers and their allies. There was always a much more powerful weapon to be deployed. If those changes were required, the firm would simply close its doors, and then individuals who work there would really suffer. Notice that households lack the option of simply closing and depriving firms of their labor power. We are back to the special political legitimacy of firms in a capitalist culture in their enduring struggle for advantage over those who provide labor power to them. It is an uneven playing field. The evidence is now clear, and it's become more clear in the last 10 years, I think, that the capitalist firm cannot be relied upon to assure the economic future of households. As managerial capitalism progresses, two aspects of this assertion will become even more apparent. The first dimension can be thought of as behavioral in nature. The second is structural. At the behavioral level, opposition to unions, pressure to keep wages low, affinity for labor-saving technology are now familiar features of the world of work. We see extreme disparity between compensation received by officers of large corporations and that received by their employees, a disparity that is extreme for the American corporation and far out of line with corporations worldwide. The capitalist firm is making a moral choice to privilege its officers and owners of capital, shareholders, over workers. We see this in the way the corporate sector dealt with the Trump tax cuts in 2017. They bought back their stocks. Did they raise wages? The capitalist firm has revealed where its values lie, and workers do not figure in that consideration. The business of business may be business, but the social legitimacy of any business is morally contingent. We come to a second challenge in, under managerial capitalism. Technical change in manufacturing, but especially automation, has profoundly transformed the historic tedium of the workplace. A single worker can now produce so much more than was deemed possible as recently as the 1990s. The relevant future is not the Marxian story of abused and degraded workers of industrial capitalism. The future is of too little work. The supply of opportunities for work will fall seriously short of the demand for work. And to put that assertion in even more stark terms, how are households going to acquire the means of life, food and shelter, in a world where work is gradually disappearing under the onslaught of automation. Experts who ponder this issue suggest that within a generation, approximately one half of the American workforce could be rendered unwanted because of automation. We need not worry if the real figure is 32% or 21% or 54. The need for thought is upon us. The 300-year experiment of household income arising from the mixing of labor with capital is coming to an end. The idea of capital hiring labor, i.e. capitalism, is now quaint and unsustainable. Capitalism is a spent force, not because it will be overthrown by a class of angry workers, as Marx would have it. Capitalism is a spent force because its defining purpose can no longer be fulfilled. Capitalism was always able to justify itself because it was simple and intuitive. One group of citizens would mobilize capital and another group of citizens would mix their labor with it, and both would be better off. Workers benefited from the ingenuity and entrepreneurial abilities of those we call owners, and this latter group benefited from the diligent hard work of the former group. Of course, the allocation of those gains was always contested, and it remains so today. But the making of object and many aspects of the service sector are now unable to abide the historic wage bargain. A growing share of household income will, in the future, necessarily come from elsewhere. Household incomes will be called a basic right. You might have heard it referred to as a universal basic income. I'll let others figure out how to design that system, but you watch. Reimagining the private firm is not an option. Who can possibly ignore the depth and breadth of economic and political frustration thick on the ground in the so-called red counties 
of the United States. Donald Trump did not produce the anger he exploits for, for political gain. He is just the messenger. He's a vessel carrying something that was taking root out in the countryside 20 years ago. The nationalist poseur is coming to power in parts of Europe, thriving on the distant odor of fascism, are not innocents in search of a political message. Frustrated Brexit voters in the UK may be confused about what is to come with liberation from the Brussels bureaucrats, but they are very clear about what angers them. In this ancient fount of capitalism, the reigning economic system ignores them, offers them no respect, smiles at their bucolic sentimentality, and infuriates them into a suicidal withdrawal from the European Union. These odd behaviors, disparaged by the urban elites in Europe and here, are a rejection of an economic system that is a meretricious trauma of possessive individualism. The private sector has abdicated any obligation for the well-being of the household. The culture of possessive individualism robs the political system of the will, the mental agility, and the financial means to remedy this threatening imbalance between firms and households. We do not know what to do because we are trapped by our cultural habits. Reimagining of the private firm, acknowledged as a public trust, must now begin. We have two distinct ideas in play. The first idea is about individuals as sole proprietors of their personhood being free to exercise within the limits of an equal autonomy for others Complete freedom of movement, freedom of thought, freedom of action. The other idea is about such liberated individuals interacting through market-mediated relations. It is necessary to notice that the usual conjunction of these two ideas is neither necessary nor logical. Markets are not necessary, nor are they sufficient to bestow full personhood. Human societies can quite easily be organized on terms that have little to do with market relations. Indeed, human history reveals that the market fetish is no more than 300, 350 years old in the Western world. The most profound clarification, therefore, concerns the idea of the sole proprietorship of our person. The principle is at the very core of the Enlightenment. The social legitimacy, the collective moral authority of this idea was foundational to the liberation of the individual in the 18th century. Freedom from dependence on the will of others meant freedom from necessary relations with others except for those that the individual enters into voluntarily with a clear view of her own interests. In other words, the newly sapient individual was necessarily the proprietor of her own, proprietor of her own personhood and her capacities for which she owed nothing to society. The idea was compelling. Since freedom from the will of others is what makes individuals completely human, each, individual, each individual's freedom can be limited only by such obligations and rules as are necessary to secure the same freedom for others. It followed that human society was a constructed realm of activity whose explicit purpose was the protection of each individual's property in her person and her acquired possessions. However, the moral force of this notion of the individual as a self-proprietor necessarily rested on the perception of a cohesion of self-interest among those who have a voice in choosing their political leaders. Here's the problem. If the free individual must work in order that she might eat, and if she can only work if she is willing to subject proprietorship over her person to the will of another person, who in this case is the owner of capital, then the most fundamental presumption of the Enlightenment is violated. It is logically impossible to be a free person and then to be obliged to submit to the commands of another person in order to survive. The gradual emergence of a possessive market culture under the claimed virtuous and freedom-enhancing experience of markets turns out to be the fatal defect of the charming promise of the Enlightenment. The rupture is complete. The evolutionary pathway of capitalism has been a gradual dispossession of those with only their labor power to acquire the means of life, nourishment. The historic presumption of common cohesion among all members of society is no longer tenable. One cannot consult the evidence and draw encouraged inferences about some presumed cohesion. 
Too many wage-earning households have been reduced to nervous and anxious foxes. Ironically, it is the very agency granted by the Enlightenment that first legitimized the possessive individual to be the master of her own functions and capabilities. But then, through the full emergence of meritocratic system predicated on the exquisite refinements of possessive individualism, it is now apparent just how very isolating and precarious life can be in a market culture if an individual is a proprietor of a single limiting asset called labor power. Managerial capitalism represents the end game of this process of dispossession and disregard that has turned individual agency and opportunity into individual subservience and marginalization. But we must also notice that this, this dispossession is not inherent or preordained in a market society. The Danes, the Swedes, the Finns, and the Norwegians have bolstered the personhood of their citizens without at the same time destroying the cohesion of interest necessary to justify the perpetuation of an economy mediated by markets. It bears mention that international surveys continue to reveal that the wealthy citizens of these four damp, cold, and often dark lands are the happiest in the world. Perhaps it is the abundance of aquavit or schnapps. Perhaps it's the many varieties of pickled herring, I'm not sure. Or perhaps it is something much more fundamental. In contrast to the Scandinavian model, the inherent tendencies of the American version of managerial capitalism have destroyed any idea of shared interest between those who own and manage capital and those who own only their labor power. Rights talk now is the common theme of social discourse. And against this cultural habit, the idea of obligation falling on the liberated individual seems anachronistic. Everyone is in for themselves. We cannot be surprised. In a society where the interests of the individual are thought to be paramount, it turns out that most individuals are charmed by the prospect of doing exactly as they wish. But some members of contemporary nation states have a much greater capacity to exploit their possessive proprietorship. Those who control capital have scant interest, scant interest in those with only their labor to sell. Members of this latter group may well imagine themselves empowered by their self-proprietorship, but it is no comfort in an economic environment where labor is seen by firms as an inconvenient cost. Those who are proprietors over an asset that is limited to labor that must be sold to reticent owners of capital increasingly find themselves with meager and dwindling market value. In the long evolutionary history of capitalism, individuals who found themselves similarly disadvantaged, makers of buggy, buggy whips, uh, harnesses, wagons, kerosene, lanterns, moved on to other lines of work because alternatives were at good supply. It is impossible to pay attention to the news and fail to notice a consensus that automation global outsourcing, and general technical change in many ordinary labor-intensive tasks now pose a serious threat to those with an ordinary and abundant manual skills. This brings us to the alleged harmony of interest within society. That is, a harmony of interest sufficient to counteract the centrifugal forces inherent in a possessive market economy. Managerial capitalism stands as evidence of the disillusion of this central aspect of the liberated individual. The celebration of our alleged rights leads to a shared idea that what we owe to others, in a word, is nothing. Those who labor owe nothing to those who own capital, and those who own capital are very sure they owe nothing to those who seek work in order that they might eat. Managerial capitalism has anointed the minuscule upper class with illusions of entitlement. It has unnerved the shrinking salaried class by closing off upward mobility. And it has rendered the bottom trawling wage class comprehensive, dis comprehensively dissolute in its haggard quest for secure livelihoods. Cohesion of interest, a necessary condition for the concept of social obligation to arise, is a distant memory. Modern society is trapped by its commitment to possessive individualism, material acquisitiveness, at the very time when capitalism no longer provides the necessary conditions for deducing a valid theory of political obligation that will prevent the continuation of a flawed social experiment. The liberated individual, she who is free from any obligation other to, than to herself, 
is seen as fully human. And yet, that very personhood, driven by the presumption of possessive individualism, prevents the crafting of any implicit contractual relations with other persons unless those relations are strictly self-serving. In a world where everyone is holding out for self-serving relations with others, interpersonal negotiations become scarce indeed. The reality of full personhood thrives as long as the personal interactions are confined to the realm of the market. We are back to basic economics, where the individual is modeled as nothing but a consumer, looking for the most utility from a financial outgain. Is that all there is to life? Obligation, because it is alien to the possessive individual, has become scarce, spotted only rarely, in fleeting moments in which the precepts of the flawed logic of personhood give way to episodic lapses of nostalgia for a time when people seem to care about others. The feeling quickly passes. The choice is stark. We either abandon the conceit of the Enlightenment or we turn our back on a society of market relations. The Enlightenment has deceived us. I have Scandinavia on my side. The manifold problems of non-market economies, whether Mao's destructive, indeed lethal communism, or the Soviet Union's comical, planned, and bloated state capitalism, offer ample evidence that however much one may despise market relations, the incentive properties inherent in the market economy are unimpeachable. An economy is always in the process of becoming. So the challenge is to acknowledge that economy is like a favorite old automobile, like the family sedan. We know what a market economy is, and we know how to maintain it so that it performs and gently carries on. Recall that the fundamental challenge in sticking with the market is to begin to wring out of it the enormous tendencies towards inequality. We are left with the necessary strategy of a full-scale assault on the destructive conceit of the individual as the sole proprietor of her functionings and capabilities, unmediated by any concern for the interests of others. In the harsh light of day and long after the soaring exhilaration of the Enlightenment has sown its underside, it is somewhat embarrassing to admit that in a society defined on such selfish grounds, none of us bear any possible obligations to others or to the society that has given us life and liberty. The philosophy Richard Rorty insists that moral progress entails recognizing the legitimacy of the interests of an ever-widening circle of others. Adhering to this idea would bring immediate scorn down on the current structure of managerial capitalism. It would delegitimize the metaphor of many foxes and a few well-served hedgehogs. Indeed, a diminishment in the prevalence of rights talk would at the same time raise the prominence of considering obligations and to others and the interests of others. A market economy need not be an arena of privilege and despair, of alienation and superfluous consumption. The American version of capitalism is certainly guilty of that. This flaw can be fixed. Given the choice of abandoning a market, or reconstituting a market economy in interest of greater equality and other regarding behavior, there can be little doubt which option is to be preferred. Societies do not, that do not bend break. Let me summarize. Capitalism as we know it is a spent force. It must be reconfigured. But it is the possessive individual who warrants serious consideration. That's us. The philosopher Josiah Royce devoted his career to the idea of loyalty. Royce talked of burdened loyalty to loyalty. Loyalty is the essence of commitment to a cause. A cause is something beyond the comfort of the isolated self. Extending one's awareness and consciousness beyond the ego-bound self requires effort. It is a chore. It can be hard. Uh, indeed, loyalty requires the extension of familiarity to the unfamiliar. More importantly, the extension of the realm of familiarity beyond the self is not as easy as become familiar with a garden or a sunset. We must entertain John Dewey's idea of trying and undergoing. Full personhood is found in rewarded burdens, but it is the undergoing, as Dewey understood, that comprises the practice of living. Full personhood is burdened loyalty to loyalty. Possessive individualism reinforced by the full flowering of managerial capitalism, denies the relevance of community. The paramount crisis of our time is that managerial capitalism does not need to wait 
for complete automation of the workplace by steel and plastic and computer chips. Managerial capitalism is well on the road to automation by other means. Mindless, numb workers, peripatetic foxes, have now become the new automation. Triumph over the voracious wranglers of managerial capitalism will only emerge when we, the possessive individual, finally abandon the deceits of the Enlightenment. Thank you very much. Thanks, Stan. We have time for a few questions. And, you know, coming from a state that's been dominated by three firms for a long time, <laughs> I think it's interesting. Um, so do we have any questions from anyone? Brady. Uh, one question I have is, so the inequalities that we that people talk about in, in, in like in the nation states say of North America, how would you view that from a worldwide perspective? So we've seen declining you know rates of impoverishment and malnourishment in the world over the same period. And I'm, I guess we could go to China and look at the household responsibility system as, as more an example of an innovation that seems more along the lines of moving things to a more individualistic system. So that's just one thing I would mind commenting on. I think Brady, China is such a, an odd idiosyncratic outlier in this larger conversation. I'd prefer not to talk about China. Uh, I think you started out by saying, what about global inequality? I believe that's where you started. Is that right? Right. So the capitalist system yeah. would be operating at a yeah. global level. And that phenomenon would be different, I think, from what we would think about the international. Yeah. I spend a lot of time on that thought. Um, it, it seems to me, and I work a lot in Africa, it seems to me that the, the, the difficulty we have is that, and it, it's the same cultural idea that works here, the market, it's almost an idea that the market can do no wrong, except, you know, a little externalities here, we've got to kind of fix it. And so in a sense, I think what's happened is the international donor community has kind of left it up to the developing world to sort of work it out. And in my cynical moments, I say the World Bank says the only thing wrong with, uh, with Nigeria is that it's not more like Norway. And the only problem with Somalia is it is not more like Sweden. In other words, you get your rules the way Sweden has them or Norway has them or whatever, and then everything will be fine. So to me, the global disparity, uh, in a sense, is extreme because, in a sense, we've sort of exported and ratified our cultural commitment to individualism and said to the developing world, get your rules like ours, and then, then things will be okay. All right? Is that, is that part of your concern? I mean... No, I was wondering though. In cap so, this kind of pessimistic picture of where we are yeah. seems to be in contrast a little bit with the more a more optimistic picture of where we are globally over the last twenty twenty. Are we optimistic where we are globally? Sure, we've had. Are a, we? Yes. Well, I mean, statistically speaking, with respect to malnourishment and the number of people, the percentage of people in poverty, does decline from around seventy five to eighty. Don't quote me, but sixty to seventy percent of the people have been lifted out of poverty over the last 25 years, have been in China. Okay? And China has done what it has done by violating almost all of the precepts of the Washington Consensus and all of the guidelines that, that we go around the rest of the world exporting. So, yeah, that, the, fine. China has done fantastic things in terms of poverty and nourishment and all of this stuff. Same thing has not happened in Africa, I can tell you, and it has not happened in the Middle East. Why do we think the people are leaving? So, in a sense, I'm not sanguine. I'm not optimistic about the larger picture. Okay. Yeah, first. We know in legal foundations, common starts with William the Conqueror, and it was one man owns the country, and it's his property. And the next millennia certainly in the English language world, is from William the Conqueror to the Magna Carta to the Parliament. And so the long story made short is that when there's a minority in control, the minority structure the rights and the endowments to its self-interest. And so you get a poor working class that are exploited and so on. But that the ray of hope for the capitalist system is, is the spread of democracy 
And as democracy is spread to the working class or just the common person and, and to women in the beginning of the 20th century. Kind of a short, short, please, because there are other questions. Short, short question, Bruce. Not a speech, but a short question. But Fine. Sorry. And so my question is that from the uh, commons point of view, the spread of democracy gives the average person the power collectively to structure the system in their interests. And so you're telling a story that capitalism is no longer serving the interests of the common person. And so you have to have a story about the widespread failure of democracy. My story is about the widespread failure of us. Okay? Us. I don't want to blame it on capitalists. I don't want to blame it on democracy. I want to blame it on us, our culture of isolated acquisitiveness. That's why the title of my book is Possessive Individualism. Okay? I don't want to blame it on some distant corporate guy. I want to blame it on us. That's why I say the title of the book is Possessive Individualism. I say is it Charlie Brown or Pogo or something? We've met the enemy. He's us. That's, in a sense, the point I'm trying to make in this. I'm tired of blaming capitalists. I'm tired of blaming whatever. I want to focus on us. Because to me, it is our acquisitive behavior, our isolation, that is the product of the, of the Enlightenment, which created us in rights talk and all of that. That, to me, is the problem. You may disagree with it. But you just said more in the last two minutes than you did in your whole talk as far as making the point. Well, thank you. I mean, I I mean seriously, that. because <laughs> until the very well, last three there, or four minutes of your talk, yeah. I didn't get it. Maybe I should have got it, but I didn't. You just gave it to me. I thought I said the failure of the Enlightenment. Sorry, I, I'll take no, that. I'll no, put no. this sentence up at the front next time. Really? It's really valuable. I mean, it, it, it's neat how you said it. Maybe if I'd been reading it yeah. a, a couple times, I, I would have got there. Okay, thank you. But the failure of us, yes, that's, to me, whether it's right or wrong, wasn't clear to me until okay. the last five minutes you're talking in this. I now. kept it till the end so you wouldn't leave. <laughs> Thanks for sticking around. I had, I, I had a class full of undergraduates, and they were bitching about China. Ah, Chinese, and I said, okay, I'll give 20 bucks to any of you who can show me you're wearing a t-shirt that was not made in China. So they're all looking, you know, where's my t-shirt made? Out of 120 kids, there wasn't a one who didn't have a sweatshirt or a t-shirt that was made in China. I, I don't want to hear any more about China from you guys, all right? So that's, to me, that's, that's what I mean by the failure of the Enlightenment. They created us as sapient individuals and look how we've screwed it up. Pat? So I, I found it really interesting that you picked that period of time in the 1980s as sort of the jumping off point and when things started to go to go yeah. in a handbasket. Yeah. And it, there's this real sort of spatial disassociation of capital and labor, uh -huh. right? Yeah. And so now in what, the last 10 years, fair trade, local foods, local, um, very local, push toward localism. Yeah. Do you think there's hope there? No. Not, if, not as long as it's around the fringes of this system. And, and what I'm saying is, there is a systems part too. We're part of the problem. But my point about managerial capitalism and the hedgehog, these guys now are running huge tranches of money and they're moving it around the world. And I think this, so there, there, there are two parts. The reason I keep stressing us is because I find it too facile just to blame capitalists all the time, all right? They can only do what we allow them to do in one sense, in our purchasing patterns. They can dismiss us, so they're, you know, they're both these things. But no, I think these are kind of feel-good band-aids around the edges of a system. And it is global capitalism that I think is, is the system, supported by us and, in a sense, our culture of individualism, which permeates the political discussion and so on. Yeah, well, you... I won't take questions from him. I sorry. Well, when you're, it, your talk put me in the mind of, and I don't know if you've um, thought about the term of, uh, the, there's, we have a market economy, but we also have a market society. Culture, market culture. Exactly. Yeah. And that is what is yeah, correct. Because a market economy cannot live in a non-market culture. So we first have this culture, and the culture is individual, 
you know, the sanctity that rites talk. And all of this it reifies and then plays in to the prevailing economic system, which is markets and choices and all of that. So the two kind of go together, right? Don't they? And my point is that when we, when we, and I have an aside in here, I said that's not how we teach economics to undergraduates. How do we teach economics to undergraduates? Huh? The consumer, okay? The individual is simply a consumer, isn't she? That's how, that's how we teach micro. We teach production, we teach consumption, okay? So that's, that's, they go together. But it is the cultural baggage of the enlightenment, the individual, rights talk, I can do whatever I want, I don't want to pay taxes because my kids are no longer in the school. Where does this come from, okay? That whole thing. And that gets into the political discussion, and that's why I say it, 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 it paralyzes the political class because they can't imagine that a market economy doesn't fix all these problems, right? I mean, the, the, the crisis of 2007, 2008, it was a big shock. I mean, markets aren't supposed to crash, and yet they did. So the culture inoculates us from the recognition that we need to do something. There is nothing wrong with automation. I'm not trying to stop automation. What's wrong is that we have a political class that can't get to the point where they say, oh, we need to have public programs to deal with the victims of automation. All right? So I just wanted to reinforce your point about the enemy being us, right? Because I, I've made this, this point myself. It's Togo or something. Right? Yeah, right. But, you know, so, so the driving force in this system, you talk about it as the hedgehogs. Minsky and I have talked about it as, as, as money managers, right? And, and, but we're talking about the same thing, you know? And, and so and their aim is, is, as you said, it's, it's the maximization of the, of, the, of, the, of the value of the funds, right, that, that they're controlling. You know, but it's not just... Um, the wealthy and the elites that have money in those funds that depend on it, right? Folks, some, fewer and fewer over time, but some have money who are apps, just workers have money in these funds that rely on it for their, for their retirement. Yeah. I, I was the, the president of, of, of a small professional association. We invest, right, and we depend on that too. So there's, there's an element that, that, that underscores your point about the enemy is us. We all benefit from that. Yeah. Maybe, maybe to well, clearly to greater and lesser degrees, but, but yeah, so that's another All of our retirement funds are part of these sovereign wealth operations, which are, you know, that's what they do. We benefit from it. So in a sense, yeah, we're there. Lindy? So, so we've got to this point, Jim, finally had, we're happy that we got the message that probably is us. And now, how did we get here? Why did we get here? And what do we do now? We, how did we get there? I think the Enlightenment created us, okay, created the individual. I'm a sapient person now. I'm not bound by any religious dogma. I don't have to listen to the sovereign anymore. I am a creative. That's what the Enlightenment did. Created the individual, free of control by superstition or kings or whatever. So they, that's, that's when we became sapient, in a sense, in control of ourself. Having acquired this agency, we became fond of it. And we didn't want to give it up. And now we have it. And we don't want to give it up. So how do we get out of it? Uh, I think what this is where it gets kind of sounds religious, but in a sense we need, as I said, we need to discover connectivities. Desire Royce talks about loyalty, loyalty to organizations, loyalty to colleagues, okay? Recreating connectivity, okay? That's, that's the way we get out of it. There's not a pill we can take to get us out of it. But we have to recognize that the alienation we see in the U.S. or in Britain or in the European Union, the alienation we see is people who have been cut loose from connectivity. Okay? In Britain, it's been fueled by 10 or 12 years of austerity. So basically, the British state has said, we don't care about you folks out in rural areas. Maybe one could say the same thing has happened here. I don't know. But it's very clear in Britain, they've gone through 10 years of austerity, and rural people, they're losing their hospitals. Is that, any, is that happening in the US? Rural hospitals closing, rural schools closing, this closing, this closing, this closing, okay? So I'm not saying we just throw money at them, but, but that's, what, that's the recent history. And I'm trying to show that that history is fueled by uh, 
an idea about a market economy? Well, let those rural people move to uh, what Richard Florida calls smart cities. They'll be fine. Just let them move to the jobs, right? That's what, isn't that the prescription often? To, you don't maybe have any red counties in Michigan, but we got a lot of them in Wisconsin. You say, well, just fine. Just pick up and move your family to Milwaukee. You'll be just fine, right? Yeah, Jim. So, kind of following up on Lindy's plea. Well, let me just say, the, the culture that we have, the, the, the kind of culture, the, mar the market will solve these problems. Therefore, we don't need government programs to help solve these problems, to help transitions, to help people, uh, I don't know, go back to school. You know, a little bit of income. I talked about, nobody's hit me about universal basic income. A little bit of income to people would do a lot of good. You know what the poverty level is in the United States? Thousand bucks a month. Okay? You know what a thousand dollars a month would do to a lot of people? A thousand a month would mean a lot. Not to us, but mean a lot to many, many people. The idea of, a, of this kind of grant, oh my God, the communists are just around the corner. Okay? It's stuff like that. A, a little different. Uh, versus the, the minimum uh, income. Uh, so, so if we go that route of how we have to get back to connectivity, and so the, the mode du jour is multiculturalism, which there's been a huge amount of pushback on. And, and the counter to that, I would say, is cosmopolitanism, this, this ability of multiple identities. And, and you talk about the different identities. Am I a household? Am I a worker? Am I a capitalist? This confluence of, okay, I'm investing in my retirement fund, so I, I have this vested interest. So the capacity to identify and be at peace with this, this multiple sense, which is cosmopolitanism, the, 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 the idea that, that and I'm not saying that all cultures are equally valid, but rather that I, can, I have the capacity to identify multiple ways facilitates an open story to that connectivity you're talking about. I, Would you agree with that or disagree with that? Or? The minute you bring in ethnicities and culture, you're complicating the equation to me well, unnecessarily. Complicated world. I mean, that's, that's yeah, yeah, but unnecessarily confounding things. I mean, the point is we've got, we've got, I think it's fair to say we have many, many workers who are holding one or two jobs. Who do you think is driving Lyft and Uber? Okay, and these people. So what is this? The Uber and Lyft drivers are foxes, aren't they? Okay, vast majority of those people are part-time workers. So that means they're not at home in the evening with their kids. They're out hustling traffic or passengers on Lyft and Uber. Okay, and and if tomorrow another thing shows up, so it's that kind of thing that that I think is going on here. And, and I don't know about it. Right, different. Yeah. Well, then let me ask this. So if, if hedgehogs care about economies of scale, costs, and foxes that care about economies of returns, profits, what's then the, the counter or parallel to, I mean, what are you prescribing to the households, the economies of well-being, and then what's the model for that? Households are these foxes who are struggling to make ends meet. Okay. okay? But, but if, if we're juxtapositioning this, this artificial construct of firms versus this natural construct with the household, yeah. Then what, what is the driving force of the household? What is, okay, so the driving the force of a household is cost. reproduction. The imperative of the household is recreation, reproduction. Some households can't reproduce, that's fine, I'm happy with that too. But the basic historic role of the household is it, it is a reproducing, okay, that's why I call it a natural. Forward, how are we going to use the driving force of the household to make this connectivity? The culture does not recognize the necessity of the household to be recreated and to, th to thrive. Okay? Most of our cultural stuff is focused on the firm, okay? making the world safe for the firm. And a few things went by that nobody reacted to. I said, there's no such thing as a private firm. Okay? I would have thought, when you say, what? What's this guy talking about? There is no such thing as a private firm. A firm is a public trust. And if we would recognize that, Kellogg and what is it over in Kalamazoo? Uh, who was in? Uh, Pfizer. Pfizer, I guess, yeah. Right? These old companies that were patronizing towards their workers. I'm not saying Kellogg was, but I mean, that's you know, the purpose. I have, a, I have a joke that Henry Ford wanted to pay his workers enough. They'd be able to buy the cars they made. 
My joke is Sam Walton wanted to pay her workers as little as possible so they would not have the opportunity to shop at any place other than at Walmart. Okay, so Sam Walton took Henry Ford and turned him upside down. Keep my workers poor so they come and buy their stuff from me. There was a question in the back, I guess. One more question. The why is UX? If the connectivity is the solution, why is choices towards despots and, I mean, the trend seems to be autocratic? Why are despots becoming yeah. popular? Is that the yeah, question? Exactly. Ah, despots promise answers to, off, to difficult questions, mm -hmm. okay? Despots have quick answers, right? But false. Pardon? But false answers. But, yeah, but you're smart. You know the answers are false, okay? You're a smart guy. Look at you. You're an elite, aren't you? The person out in the red county, wherever she is, maybe, you know, maybe that's where our trouble is. We, we tend to think instrumentally, don't we? Well, there's this problem. We'll turn this dial. It's what Paul Krugman calls dashboard economics. So you got a trouble there. You just turn this dial and it will be fixed. We have these mental models of connectivity. The rural, or I hate to even say rural, just the people left behind don't have that mental dashboard, as it were, that if they fix this and this and this and this, their life will get better. But what they know is that the system for the last 25 years has resulted in really bad outcomes for them. Do we agree on this? There are many, many people who for 25 years know that things, you know, before 2008, real household income had been stagnant for 20 years in the U.S. This is, we know this. That's a chronic problem. People can live with chronic, chronic stuff, okay? At my age, I live with a lot of chronic stuff. I can't run as fast as I used to and, you know, whatever. That's chronic. But when you get hit with acute stuff, bam, that's a different world. 2008 was an acute shock. And we're now living in the wake of that, okay? So a despot can come into this and promise to make things better. And the typical person said, yeah, for 25 years, things were really bad. This person is going to make it better. There's an enormous appeal in that. You see that? Can I have 30 no seconds to turn your story on Pardon? its head? Can What's I have that? 30 seconds to turn your story on its head? 30 seconds, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. OK, so the problem is that you're spinning is not enough connectivity, but too much connectivity, because what's happening is the white people in the prosperous northern hemisphere in particular are coming into much greater connectivity with people, brown and black people from other countries, and it is creating this huge backlash, white backlash, white nationalism that is powering all this anger and so on. And so the tyrants are coming from people who want to limit those connectivities and maintain their privileges, and also just don't want to associate with the other people. Okay, that's fine. I mean, that's, that's part of the and, and that ties into his story about why Sweden and Norway actually don't have these problems, which you were talking about, is because they're homogeneous countries. They're not so homogeneous anymore. Well, that, and, they're, and they're having more social problems. They're having more social problems. Right. And that itself fuels despots who, I think the point is, we have to define what we mean by a despot. I think you mean a strong person, Right? with a clear message. I mean, that's probably a pretty good definition of a despot, right? Powerful and simplistic message. And I think the question was, why are these guys becoming elected in Europe and in the U.S.? I'm not about the despot issue. I'm about your central thesis, which is you're saying not enough connectivity. And I'm saying, at least in this dimension, there's people see there's more connectivity than they want. Well, I think we're going to have to... Sorry, we're going to have to end now. We're going to get to end up on this.